Hi everyone. Hope you you all are great and enjoy the weekend. Uh, we are live with another session today to talk about the things we love. Today I'm very proud to have opportunity to talk with the guy connected from Brooklyn, New York. I'm talking about the Michael Theodore Mauro Jr. They was born in Brooklyn in 1973. So a young fellow when the disco era is started. Hi, my friend. Welcome aboard. Thank for joining me. Uh, I appreciate uh, your acceptance uh, about my invitation to join this session. It's my pleasure. Welcome aboard again. Michael. How are you? Thank you. Yeah, yes, I'm doing fine. What about you today? Uh, is it snowy in New York or what about the weather? I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 50 degrees today. Yeah, it's, it's, 40, uh, 40 something degrees. Okay. It's a, it's a 40 typical... degrees, 40, 40 degrees, not too bad for January. Yes, uh, we have the same in Porto, Portugal. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, to send a big shout from guys, your partners in crime, right? Jane Groen in Boynton Beach, Florida, Donald Cleveland, uh -huh. the guy uh, from Brooklyn, New York, and Johnny D. Brooklyn, everybody. It's like yeah. a, a partner in crime, except <laughs> Jane <Jenny> Groen. <laughs> Everybody well, living in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, most, <laughs> most of my uh, most of my partners in crime are around here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, before uh, starting describing the agenda, I'd like to highlight to show uh, a book uh, uh, edited by T. Groove from Tokyo, uh, New York. It's about this. Mm. It's a uh, uh, disco Madness, uh, the ultimate guide to disco music and from 1973 and 1982. It's a nice one, uh, 360 page full color. Uh, let me open something you can see. Uh, on the first, you can see uh, the Glory Gainer uh, checking uh, her albums, LPs at the time. A lot of the disco stuff, uh, and, uh, but okay. In Japanese, right? You need to be expert in Japanese, but you, well, I, I not, think not, it, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but you can use some uh, out of the translators, camera translators, automated. You can use it, put on the your mobile phone and try to read. But a lot of the great covers and a lot of the great stories. And uh, well, it's a nice one. T Groove from Tokyo. He's a good. He's a good guy. I, I know him a little bit. He's a good guy. Yeah, good there's guy. a lot of good work out there. Yes, a great one. I love the Japanese guys. I love the Japanese guys. So uh, let me describe the agenda. Uh, the guy have a lot of stories, but uh, we are going to focus on the basically some topics. Uh, first of all, we start in talking about the, the mic, early days, the background, DJ by yourself, uh, gigs, reference, radios, early 80s, right? After, after that, we are, uh, are going to talk about the business stuff and uh, the involvement with the music industry, the challenge and the achievements, production, licensing, all kinds of stuff, CD, vinyl, streaming. Uh, after, uh, we reserve a specific uh, topic to talk about the mic collections. It's about the heritage, uh, acetate, test pressing, read to real, master tape, all kinds of stuff. And uh, also, uh, a special talking about the late Ray White Law. The man behind the Moment of Truth, uh, Half Carter, Nocturnal Original Soundtrack. And uh, finally, uh, we are going to talk about the new progress coming and ideas for 2023. I think it's uh, good enough, right? It's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Plans plenty for a Saturday afternoon, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the beginning. Uh, I think you, you was born too late or not, in your opinion, because most oh, of guys, most definitely. of guys, uh, every every place on this planet. OK, Mike, it's a disco warrior, disco police, something like that. I don't know. But the guy, well, OK, he probably Mike enjoying a lot the the early disco years or disco fever stuff like that. But talking about uh, did you regret to to was born? <laughs> oh, yeah, too late? yeah, yeah, pretty, yeah. I feel like I missed out a lot of the you know a lot of the good stuff that 
I see posted on Facebook about, you know, about the, the paradise, not so much the studio 54 days, but just like, I feel the earlier days, I missed out on a lot of the record hunting, you know, going to the labels, getting the promos and, uh, you know, I missed out on stuff like the garage and the fun house and, you know, just stuff like that. I was a little too young for that. You know, That's, uh, I'm fine. very pressing because, uh, we know a lot of guys. Uh, that live it at that period, the great period, the disco fever, the early days. To be honest, uh, my favorite disco year, it's a uh, lot of guys agree. Uh, to me, it's a 74, 75, 76. In my personal opinion, in my humble opinion, that's the period we got a lot of the great productions, the Philly sound. It's not about that great mainstream. A lot of the good stuff, a lot of the Garbage, right? <laughs> to be honest, the I, disco fever. I I love the especially 70s since I collect 12 inches. I you know I love 1975, 1976 because yeah. there wasn't a lot of like crazy remixed 12 inches. Everything like about pretty much the, the you know if you wanted the long version, it was on a 12 inch. It was basically the LP version or the unedited version, and you know everything was pro basically everything was promo to the to the DJs or the pools you know there's no commercial 12 inches and it's that that's the stuff i hunt i mean i could have 10 copies of the same record it just i still get the same thrill when i find it the 10th time addicted. the first time at the 10th cop it's the 10th time yeah, yes i think it's the record pool years i think it's uh, that's a, was a big time right it's a big time also uh also as well i love the funk years of late 70s and the early 80s a lot of good stuff in the funk as well well uh let's talk about uh, so your reference uh, your favorite djs and remixers that shape it your style let's talk about that M mike please uh you know what the first dj that i really like locked onto and followed his stuff was probably louis vega because I listened to, you know, in New York, they had a Saturday night dance party on New York radio on, I think it was uh, Hot 103 or Hot 97, one of those stations. And you would just hear them play and man, he, like he would mix flawlessly and just like, that's what kind of drew me into, you know, wanting to, hey, let's see what that's all about. You know, start DJing and start playing around. Like I had a small little setup in my bedroom back. It was probably like 80, 1987, 88. And I just, I tried to mimic everything that he did, you know, the smooth transitions and, you know, just playing, playing the freestyle records, going back from the dub versions to the club versions. And just, you know, that was the first guy I remember. I mean, there was uh, a bunch of guys on that station, but like, he definitely stood out and made me want to like try and, you know, oh, maybe I could do that, you know? Yes, I can understand the probably at the time when you were starting involving and oh, excited. Uh, listen disco or funk music in the uh, the great fm station at the time probably jelly bean chef petbon francois something like that those you know what those were a little bit before before me i think uh, you know maybe in the 882 83 84 those guys were playing on kiss fm or bls i know paul simpson you know he was a, he's a good friend of mine and i know he was playing on i think bls back then and that was just before I started, you know, because in 87, 88, I was, you know, 15, 14 years old, 15 years old. So I just kind of was like, eh, you know, I'm kind of interested in doing that. But I didn't hear much of that stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, you, uh, I forgot to mention, but I'm not, uh, I'm not going to forget, forget to mention the Paul Simpson. It's a part of, it's a one of the part in, in crime, but I will mention that guy later on, on this session. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the first of all, I just uh, uh, sent big shout for the guys uh, I have contact, uh, friendship, the Jane Grun, Don Cleave, and Johnny D. And uh, uh, so, yes. But what about the disco ears? I think it's uh, uh, talking about your the guys from disco ear. You uh, started connecting using the social media stuff like that, like Jane Grun. Talk about the the, the guys. You starting connecting using the social media, etc. Uh, but you know, you know what? I never really went. I never went after like like I see people go after like the disco artists and try and the producer, the, the old type of try and make contact with them and try and you know just buy, make friendships with. I like I didn't really, you know, I didn't really do that at first. Like at first, I would just do a mix, 
and I just throw it up on like SoundCloud or whatever. And and Jay contacted me, and uh, you know he got in touch with Ian Dewhurst, who kind of you know I like caught his ear a little bit. But the guy that really like got me started with the multi tracks was probably it was probably Johnny D because he was the first guy who had that I knew that had these things. And he was, you know, I didn't even know what they were. I saw him in a box at his place and he was like, oh, those are multi-tracks, you know? And I, he kind of made a big deal about guy, you know, guys having them and not having, and I, and I just was like, oh, what's that all about, you know? And then, you know, then Jay contacted me and Ian Dewhurst and just, I got a lot of friend requests and it just spiraled from there. But, you know, in the beginning I contact, you know, I tried to friend request, you know, producers like, you know, John Morales and, you know, Tom and, uh, you know, who else, uh, you know, I have Victor Rizzato. Oh, so slowly but surely I had a bunch of them. Yeah, it's a good guys. I love Jane Groom. Uh, I always learn something every day when I talk to that guy. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a disco war or disco police. What about this? Yeah, it was disco always police? disco police, I think. <laughs> disco <Yeah>. police. <laughs> Jay was the guy, what, you know, Jay was, you know, it still is, you know, one of the guys who I send, who I'll send something to first, you know, yeah, like I'll, I'll be doing something and I'll send it over to him and he'll be like, eh, before you send it in, you know, maybe you could tweak this or maybe you could tweak that. I mean, you know, Tom kind of does the same thing. So, you know, I guess he, you know, Jay is the man, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I totally agree. The guy, it's like an advisor, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Police, yeah, I mean, but I would say the advice. Okay, let me check this. You need to fix that. You need the remaster is not good. Talking about the Donald Cleavy, it's a king of remaster, right? Yeah, I mean, he's pretty much, you know, he pretty much did most of my stuff. I mean, I had a little, you know, a little, you know, time where I was, you know, Mike Tarzia was doing stuff for me, oh, but then okay. he passed away, unfortunately. You know, but, Don, you know, Donald's been my guy. Yeah, it's a, you need a great team. To work together because the guys uh, you know you contribute each other i think you understand your mindset right and at the yeah. same time you know the techniques uh, they have they have a great test so i think it's a, a great combination uh, that kind of partnership i, I love well, once that. you get once you get started like donald knows how i like something to sound now you know so after a while i just feed him something he'll send it back to, he'll send me one or two versions and they're both kind of right in my wheelhouse and i'll just pick one and okay let's go with this one you know but he he knows what i want same thing with mike tarzia mike tarzia knew i sent him something he sent it right back to me like an hour later yeah he knew what i wanted so, so. right now uh may i say all those guys those guys uh, and you are on the same page right when you start to discuss something about a new project or something like that you know okay you got it. It's easy. I don't, even, it's I don't easy. even have to discuss it. I don't even have to discuss it with them. I would just send it over and just Donald knows how I like it to sound. And he sends okay, it back to me. Do your job. Do That's your it. job. Okay. Let me know. No questions. No issues. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I try not to mic. I try not to micromanage other people's expertise. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if it's Donald easy. sends me two versions here, I think this one's good. I think this one's better and I'll listen. And you know, it's not, I don't go back a hundred times, fix this, fix that, fix this. I, I, you know, I go with their gut. Absolutely. Uh, the guys can cover hundred percent of the requirements. You need to deliver something professionally. I, I, I totally agree. A lot of maturity, right? They, they get, they got maturity enough to deliver the great sounds, uh, something that, like that. Uh, I totally agree. Well, uh, well, when we start to mix it right now, when I when I listen your mixes from the beginning, the style, the breaks, something like that, I can. Okay, may I say you got some um, a signature? May I may I say because when I start to listen to your twelve singles, uh, Philly stuff, uh, everything like that, the breaks, etc., etc. The well. Uh, I, I I can I can understand identify some signature. Uh, is it true or not? Do you agree? I you know what I try not to do it. I mean like like a record like Love Is the Message. I I got a chance to do Love Is the Message, and from the That's beginning good. to the middle to the end, I don't like to break the. I don't like to really destroy the original flow. You know, like some guys will take this part, put it here. This part, put it there. This part, put it there. That, I like to I like to just keep the original kind of flow. Maybe make this longer, this shorter. The progression. You know, maybe, the progression. Yeah, I don't like to ruin the original progress because I mean I hear some stuff and you you know you're just getting going and you know there goes the momentum. You know I I try not to you know do that but you know yeah. that's basically 
Yes, that's absolutely. Really that's mean. that's one of the things I I take in account when I listen to music. Even a uh, lot of people using the multi tracks to create stuff, etc. Okay, good things around, but uh, the guys some some sometimes I can see guys destroying the original f mood, the progression, stuff like that. Maybe to try to achieve or different audiences, maybe, but. If you deliver something for the guys uh, that know the original one, they got experience, leave those golden years, man, it's a tragedy, right? It, it, I, it know, cannot it, work. I, you know what? They, you know, I was, I was that guy, you know, doing, you know, just throwing stuff up there, doing stuff, throwing it up on SoundCloud. I mean, there's guys doing that now. And you know what? If somebody does something, they listen to it back and they like it, God bless them, you know? Someone wants to make a house version of a, of a disco record or whatever, you know, they got their audience. God bless them. Me, I just, you know, <laughs> like I did the Candy State and Young Hearts Run Free. I always go back to that. I mean, I originally did that like in 2011. And I still get people on Facebook or on Instagram that'll message me and tell me that that's like their favorite. And like, I mean, this is 2011, 2012, it's 10 years later that they still play my version. So, I mean, listen. You, you yes. know, everybody does their thing. Fine. I'm happy. You do what you want. I don't care anymore. You know, I just, you know, I just know how I like the record to sound. And if more people like the way I, I mean, obviously people at Warner Brothers, people at Sony, you know, people at some of these labels, they enjoy it enough to give me a license to use it. So yes. that's I, what I matters to me. Uh, yes. The, uh, the, I, I like that approach. It's why you, you got uh, popularity all over the world. Every every place on this planet, the guys still playing disco vibes or remix and stuff like that. Well, you got a lot of the fans uh, around the world. So, uh, but uh, let's talk about your, uh, well, how did you meet uh, the Tom Autumn? How was that, that experience? It was a, a masterclass talking about that moment. I, you know what, I met Tom, I actually reached out to him on Facebook Because I had some, like I had gotten a couple of multi tracks that I got online, you know, that, and I'm like, wow, I, you know, I got gold here. Like I didn't realize what else was out there. And I said, oh, maybe Tom, you know, would want this to mess around with, you know, and I contacted him and he's like, what do you got? And I told him what I had. He's like, oh, yeah, no, I got that. I've had that for years. And then we just started talking about this and about that. And, you know, he invited me up to his place to kind of critique a couple of the things that I was playing around with, which I had no clue as far as like engineering a mix. So I had stuff and, you know, the instruments were all over the place. The drums were all over the place. And he was like, nah, basically, I... basically it was a masterclass about the techniques, uh, the tradition, it's a tone signature, right? It was more, yeah, it was more about, you know, getting the positions of some of the instruments, right. And, you know, like I would have something, you know, to the left and Tom is like, no, 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 no. When you're looking at something, you know, that thing's got to be in the middle and this has got to be over to this way and you can't have these two things on the same side. So it's more like an engineering class, actually, you know, and good thing. I, I mean, I picked up on it pretty good. You know, I'm a pretty, you know, I'm pretty good with computers and stuff like that. So I picked it up, you know, a couple yeah, of trips so, over there. I kind of had it and went with it. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it, those kind of experiences, uh, basically, I, th I think it defined a lot of the the most of topics uh, about your uh, the way you shape it your style right it's a combination of skill the things you learn your potential your talent and against the guys the party your partner when you combine those kind of things you have uh, you uh, i can understand how you deliver very good about the classics right so the one thing i realized about doing all this is one of the most and almost almost right up there as important as doing a good mix is mi is mixing stuff that isn't done by a hundred different people you know try, like now i realize that now there, it's there's certain things you got to go through to get these multi-tracks it's not as easy as it was but you know access is just almost as just as important because somebody hears a mix of a new song that nobody else mixed You know, it means it, it means a lot to me because I all right, you put your stamp on it now. You know what I'm trying to say? Like before, it was like I did a mix of this. John did a mix of the same thing. Tom did a mix of the same thing. Dimitri did a mix of the same. I'm trying not to do so much stuff that's been done already. 
So I think just having the access and just having different tracks kind of gives you, you know, it, it just makes it sound better. You know what I'm trying to say? It just makes it sound better that you're doing something that hasn't been done a hundred times. So yes. that's one of my techniques now is to try and just go to the labels and pay, I'll pay whatever for the, for the tape transfer, just as long as it isn't done a hundred times already. Yeah, so we, we have some topics to cover about the techniques about your production later on on this session. But uh, speaking about the DJ, the people, I think a lot of celebrities become a DJ nowadays. Man, it's not serious, right? Because nowadays there is no challenge in mix electronic stuff using the technologies. Maybe it's like a robot play something. Uh, in the past, I think skills were mandatory. Mixing disco was so tricky, right? Using the basic turntables and mix it, talking about uh, how do you see that different scenarios. In the past, when you start to play something using turntables, maybe it's uh, you got challenges, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first, you know, the first times I started DJing, I was doing mobile DJing, parties and house parties and weddings and, you know, whatever. And, you know, I was lugging the records, lugging the turntables, setting everything up, making sure nobody bumped your table, you know, making sure everything was all right. And, you know, the first time I DJed in the club, it was the same thing. It was like there was a rotary mix. Like, I never used a rotary mixer before, so you had to know what you would do. I mean, there was no slam this record and slam that record. It was like you had to kind of know what you, you know, have a feel for what you were doing. And I was just talking to another guy that I know that DJs now. And he's telling me with this, with his uh, record box of Serato, how he's got the brakes and loops all programmed in already. So, you know, he takes a four bar break and it automatically loops for him so he could mix over it or whatever. It's like, if you wanted to re-edit, you had to do something on a reel to reel. And then, you know what I mean? Like there was no way to do that back then. Yeah, I think it's a most of the, your career in the beginning. Uh, maybe I think you play in clubs or resident for clubs, probably it's not was your uh, role at the time, right? So most uh, play uh, working uh, mobile DJ or play radio, uh, radio mix shows, DJ, something like that. Uh, it's about your preference. It was about your preference at the time or the, talking about uh, that different roles instead of the work as a resident at the time. Well, the, doing the mobile DJ, like I started DJing mobile before I had a driver's license. So I had gotten a friend of mine to be my partner because his father had a station wagon. <laughs> so he was my partner. Father would drive <laughs> us to the jobs. I was about making money. You know, I was always yeah, like, you yeah, know, yeah. trying to do something to make money. So, you know, the, the mobile DJ work, you know, made money and, you know, the club work really didn't at the time. So I really didn't care much about it. I just I was a bus boy in the club. Yeah. And they just needed a DJ one night. And he was like, I was like, oh, I, you know, I could play for you tonight. And, you know, I did it a couple of times, maybe for a year or so here and there. But I was never a club guy. Yeah. It's... I was never really a club goer. So it really didn't matter to me to be in a club. You know, it was just, you know, radio I like doing. That was more, the... So radio, radio uh, was more comfortable or you prefer right now, today. Let, let's uh, let's back to the, the, uh, the current days uh, for you. It's more comfortable to play mix shows on the studio or something like that, or playing for the crowd or big crowds. Uh, I think it's it, it's comfortable, or you prefer playing uh, in radio mix shows and stuff like that. Yeah, I like doing mix shows only because I could, you know, now with the technology, I could take my time and do it at my leisure and prepare them. And you know, I've done some, you know, some like guest spots with you know local DJs, whatever. But I mean, this. I mean, there's really no draw for me to, to do. I'm not up on current music. Like, I don't listen to new, really new music. I don't, you know, I can't sift through thousands and thousands of tracks a week to try and make a playlist to play. So, you know, it's I just, I can't, you know, and with my job, I just don't have the time. Yeah, it's, uh, yes. Uh, but can you recall uh, the first time you play in the club before the, for the crowd uh, playing disc or play different style? Can you recall? Uh, yeah, it was probably like, yeah, it was probably, well, the first time I DJed in a, in a real club was probably like 1991. I always remember it was 1991 or 1992, because I remember the big, the biggest promo that I had gotten at the time was a, a, a double pack of Janet Jackson. I think it was Janet Jackson. The track was If. It was like really like they were selling it in, in Vinyl Mania for a lot of money. So I actually got this and like I couldn't wait to get there and play it. And so it was probably 92, I think, around there. Mm-hmm. 
But it was definitely a rush, though. It was definitely a rush because that the place I played at was a local place, but it was always pretty packed on a Friday and Saturday. So it was, it was a rush. But uh, what? But what? What about the the crowd and the reactions? Or people boring you, asking you to play that or that kind of stuff? It's just, it sucks, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know what? A couple of people would come, like, come towards the booth and, you know, try and flip through the records. And, but for the most part, I mean, if I remember, like, my first time that I did it was like a really busy night. And it was like everybody was, I was just playing disco freestyle, some, you know, commercial house stuff. And it was just, to me, it seemed like they enjoyed it, you know, because they kept letting me do it. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so the residence uh, was not your business for sure at the time, right? Okay. Nah, I was like a fill-in guy. I would fill in when they needed me, and you know, they were trying to do like a teen night on Wednesday night, and I did that for a couple of weeks, I think, and that was it. That was like the mid '90s, probably the early, probably '92, '93, '94 around there. Okay, great. Um, before uh, starting talking about the business, I would like to understand your music style, your preference for different scenarios. I have four scenarios. First of all, talking about your music style preference to listen yourself, okay, put on the phone and enjoy the music, to play as a DJ and in the radio stations, to create remixes for you in the radio station, and finally to create professional remix for the record company. Let's start with the to listen. Uh, what is the music style you, you, you enjoy and listen, okay, on the red phone? Is, loud put the system loud etc why do you prefer believe, believe it or not i i listen to a lot of alternative rock and a lot of classic rock ah cool from 70s yeah black sabbath the rolling stones yeah 70s oh, the early rock. 80s yeah and then i listen to a lot of 90s too you know a lot of 90s alternative like pearl jam and sound garden and you know yes. stuff that'll just wake you up at five o'clock in the morning when i'm driving to work you know Yeah, probably the audience, uh, the audience is not aware about that. Yeah, Because probably not. People, people they expect, okay, that's the disco guy. Let's talk about 100% the disco, but <laughs> I mean, I'm wanting to know that. You can't do it all the time. <laughs> gotta be a, you got to refresh your ears so, a little bit. Yeah, so you, you listen to the classic rock to refresh your mind, okay, let's relax. Because disco, <laughs> okay, as professional, but what about... Uh, the kind of music style preference to play as a DJ in the radio mix show? What kind of the, the style you prefer to play? I, like, I like to play like more, you know, commercial type of, you know, disco, more well-known disco, like, and, 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 you know, the, like the Latin freestyle stuff from the early, you know, the mid eighties, stuff like that. The, you know, the planet rock kind of stuff from the early eighties. Mm -hmm. It's more popular stuff. I, I'm really not the type of guy that goes out digging for, for something that nobody else ever heard. Like, I like to just keep it mainstream. Yeah, the, I play. It was a big time in the uh, the break, the break years, right? In the beginning of the break year, a lot of the move stuff, a lot of the, the hype, a lot of the productions like Arthur Baker stuff, the So Sonic Affair, oh, yeah, the that's... Africa Bambata, a lot of the good guys at the time, right? The Africa Bambata, the Arthur Baker stuff, the, uh, the stuff on Streetwise Rec. Goods, the rockers, the rascals, like, like, yeah, the rascals, right? The Latin the rascals, yeah, the rascals, but, the kings of edits, right? <laughs> but more, you know what? More the Arthur Baker stuff because the Arthur Baker stuff. When I when I first started buying records in a record store in the late eighties, eighty seven, eighty whatever it was, then after that, I was like, well, you know what? Let's check out what came before this stuff, and that's how I started getting into looking for the older stuff, but. Yeah, the Planet Rock sound and all of that stuff. Like, I was really into, like, I have 10 copies of Planet Rock back here. Like, every time I see it, I buy it. What? And, 10? Yeah. 10 copies? Yeah, probably close to 10. That, that's But, a typical uh, Yeah, the Arthur Baker guy. stuff. <laughs> the Arthur Baker stuff really, like, made me want to, like... I love, I love. I, I personally uh, love those kind of the Arthur Baker remixes uh, he did for the uh, Daryl Hall and John Notes, big time. I love those mixes. Method of Modern Love, Out of Touch stuff, something like yep. that. Arthur Baker, mm -hmm. it's a genius guy. I, lo I love that guy. G great. Guy. Breaker, and Breaker's Revenge, like one of the most, Ooh. like one of the craziest, uh, you know, like instrumental kind of tracks it. ever. Uh, did, did you have opportunity to, to contact Arthur Baker at the time or? No, I spoke to him on, on uh, Facebook a couple of times, you know, recently, okay. you know, years ago, maybe five, six years ago, but you know. 
account. He, he, uh, he's not really uh, a Facebook guy. I never saw that guy on the social media. Maybe I'm not yeah, sure. He's not he's really a, much on yeah, it. Uh, no activity, right? Uh, okay. Uh, what about the style preference to create a remix for you, for yourself, or to play in the radio shows? What kind of style you prefer to create remix? Okay, let's create something to play on the specific FM station, something like that. Ah. Uh... Probably more like the like the Philly International stuff, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, good option. I think it uh, sounds good in the airwaves, right? That Philly sound, the Sigma sound, it's amazing sound. Uh, probably the best sound ever, right? Yeah, so what's that and Sal Soul? Uh, Talk about like just like it, it surrounds you and it just grabs you, you know, just sound quality. It's so deep the sound quality. It's so, like so you're in a concert hall. Every Philly record you listen to, you crank it up, you feel like you're in a concert hall. Yes, it's the king of purism, like uh, Joe Tars, a lot of the sound engineer, the best of the best the music industry can deliver, right? Uh, probably. Without a doubt. It's, uh, it's impossible to, to see something even close to that, right? It's possible in silver because it's, it, to, nowadays it's too expensive. Imagine it. You have a Don Renaud conducting a big session of string sessions, violins and stuff like that, uh, three guitars, a uh, rhythm session by Norman Harris, uh, Hugh Young, uh, that the bass on the drums. It's too much, right? For, for the uh, current uh, music industry. It's basically impossible. I was having this conversation with a friend of mine over dinner about new music. And my whole thing with new music is, here. Yeah, this is it, new music. Playing... <laughs> One note, Jeez. one note, one, and it like the Philly stuff, the South so you're surrounded with an orc. It's it, it it's it's almost not fair to, to compare the two. No, you no, can't no. compare the two. It's it's a bit the same sentence. It's a one of a kind. That's that sounds so one of a kind. You cannot compare the 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 Sigma sound uh, to the different styles uh, the, because it's too much. When when you see the big the orchestration, the backup orchestra orchestra to the Philly sound. Uh, the 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 MVP caliber professionals, right? A a every yeah. guy oh. working for that particular sound studios, uh, man, it's a god, like a god. Even considering a lot of people, uh, you cannot see on the credits, right? You can see the credits for the musicians, but what about the people behind the scenes, like the sound engineer, the Joe Tarson, the setting, the fine turning the mic, man? It's uh, it's the best of the best. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, for the finally, uh, what what music style you prefer to create professional remix for record companies? Because we are going to talk about more uh, your relationship with the majors. Uh, which kind of style? Imagine it. you are thinking about uh, create some approach to uh, to show or share your showcase or portfolio with the some uh, particular new probably you try to get a new deal with the record pump what, sh what what should be your approach uh create something to be attractive for the great guys well uh I, I mean i just try and make it i just try and make it sound like it, it was done back then you know what i mean and like somebody found it on a lost tape you know what i mean like i just try and make it, you know I, I, like i don't know I, it's it's hard to say, like something I just get in the mood for and I just, oh, you know what? That would be good. Let me see if I can get that and do that. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, I, I don't know, <laughs> to showcase is probably to get something that was three minutes long and make it six and make it interesting. Extended, right? Yeah, like, yeah, without being just like cut and paste one section. Maybe, know, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe after your first experience, deliver something or get deals uh involved with the sun stuff uh majors maybe you you know what should be the best approach to convince those guys right because i think the your first experience delivering something for the majors it was a challenge right oh how can i starting what should be the, i need to thinking about some good approach to make a deal well uh, you know what the first thing i put out was actually ian dewhurst did you know he took the reins on it and it was basically a lot of the stuff that i had done already and just put it on soundcloud or i gave to jay so he just compiled all of it and you know he did all the legwork and got them all cleared or whatever and uh you know that was that i mean i didn't really have to do anything but just give him the stuff and just you know annoy him every other day to, when's it coming out when's it coming out because i had no clue how long this stuff took 
you know. Yes, I can understand. <clears throat> well, uh, next, let's talk about the business. So, as you know, uh, you got p popularity releasing disco remix, excluding remarkable Philly stuff. Uh, why vinyl release? Uh, how record labels view this format right now? Because in the UK, there is a solid vinyl culture. Even including 45s, lot of the releases every day, every month, available and the more to come. Uh, why vinyl releases right now? I, you can see I'm a fan. No, no, vinyl. I know, I know. <laughs> You're a vinyl guy. I, but, what, but when you start to release something for the market, you need to take into account, okay, the business, not only your preference, right? Okay, vinyl is great, I agree with you, it's a collector, no, no doubts. But why vinyl releases take into account the market? Because the markets right now, okay, a lot of the stream stuff, CD, vinyl, uh, why do you decide release a lot of mixes in vinyl for my and not CD or streaming something like that? Well, it, it seems like the people who like my my work, they seem to be vinyl guys, you know, and not so much CD guys, you know, and, and streaming. I mean, the U.S. stuff, they really don't want to do vinyl at all or CD. Everything is streaming and I don't know. I just the people who really appreciate the work, they buy the vinyl. They want the vinyl. So, so it's like uh, I would say it's like uh, uh, releases for the Mike Morrow collectors of fans. It's a limited yeah, edition, something like that. Yeah, basically. But like when I get the report, I mean, there's a lot more people out there buying them than I originally thought. I mean, it's not you know, I get the statements and I see, you know, that they're on the third pressing of the Odyssey uh, Native New Yorker 12 inch. You know, we're already on the third pressing of uh, love is the message. So, you know, there's more people out there buying them than I even thought. So, you know, I guess, you know, it's the culture. Yeah, it's about the culture. So, but what about, uh, how do you define the the press? The press, the number of uh, vinyl release, how do you define some, uh, the limit, uh, let's start with the 200 copies or something like that? Yeah, usually, yeah, usually it's, uh, they, you know, they'll start with, you know, you'll have to kind of guarantee a certain amount, you know, when you're applying for licenses. So you'll guarantee 1500 or three, 2000 or whatever. And you, you go from there. Yes. Um, Wes, uh, do you like to be known uh, uh, with that signature? May I say a Mike Morrow remix is a signature. Do you consider is a signature or not? Yeah, kind of. I just, you know what? I just. I just started doing it and, you know, it kind of looked nice on the labels. <laughs> I left it. It wasn't really any much thought into it. I just put it on there. I was like, wow, that looks pretty good. Okay. Uh, people, uh, uh, people, uh, they want to send some meshes so I can uh, transfer the meshes. Maybe uh, Mike can respond. Let me check some of the social media. Okay. One minute. Uh, Okay, I reserved some time to, to check the, the social media, a lot of the people involving, to put questions, uh, if uh, the respectable questions, right? <laughs> respectable yeah, whatever. Questions. <laughs> whatever. I'm going gonna, gonna to filter, because uh, nowadays, social media, it's, uh, man, it's a crazy stuff. Okay, let's talk about your, your, your approach. How do you introduce yourself uh, to a new record label or majors you never got the deal before okay you have a relationship with sony i know but imagine you, you are thinking about get new deal with a new for universal stuff or new uh, or bmg something like that how how do you introduce yourself or thinking about the strategy to convince the guys okay let's do that uh well you know what i tried plenty of times to get stuff going with universal music and they're just impossible not worth it not worth the time and effort at all for me uh you know sony yeah i have a contact at sony in the us and i also have a couple in the uk and it's kind of been you know what to introduce an idea kind of have to have like you know a game plan you know what i mean you can't just you know throw out an email and be like hey you know what i feel like doing something because they get this all day long so, you know, the OJ's thing I have coming out, it's, 
no, you have an idea. This is what I want to do. Is there tapes? Can it be done? And once you have a relationship with these people, like it's just about like everything that I've been given them has been coming back. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I mean, I have so much stuff lined up for 2023. It's I don't have to do anything right now, and I'm I'm good for the year. <laughs> yes, for, but in the sunny uh, um, Warner Brothers you, is a little tough. The tougher. Yeah, do, do you consider uh, you, you have the open space? It's the open door policy to okay. Let's have a meeting. Let's get a meeting to discussion. I have some ideas I would like to discuss. It's comfortable right now. It's open space. You can create some room space to discuss new ideas or offer something new for the guys. Everything I everything I put across to Sony US or Sony UK gets some kind of, you know, gets some kind of, yeah, let's see what we could do on that. You yeah, know, so, so you, it's a kind of the good reputations yeah, on, absolutely. The, on the sun. It's a great. Uh, are, are you try something uh, uh, involving the different majors? OK, the Universal, I know the, 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 the scenario you have explaining a lot. Uh, it's not a part of that discussion. But what about the, the BMG stuff or with the salsa, right? BMG, it's a. I, I have seen some guy, the guys creating from multi tracks for, for BMG uh, recently. Uh, 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 do you think you have more, you can create so, more room space uh, involving different majors, or right now it's uh, almost impossible? No, well, I, have a, I have a relationship with uh, Warner. You know, in the UK, and but they're a little bit again, they're a little bit tougher to get responses from. You know, it's like I'll send an email and I'll get an email back. You know, a month later, you know, and then you'll go back and forth with the studio looking for tapes. So it's really a long, you know, really it's too long of a process. I, I basically I it's things, a life cycle, right? Done. You have a life cycle. You need to start uh, uh, with some ideas, okay? Because I think I have heard a lot about that scenario nowadays the new managers prefer earn money easily at the low cost okay but if you're talking about okay you need to get licensing after you need to try to find the tapes or it's a lot of the steps it's a part of the, the the long life cycle right until okay let's do that and uh, create some forecasting to make money stuff like that uh, it's a challenge right to convince the guys nowadays I, you know what? I really, I don't push. I, you know, if I don't get a reply or if I don't get a positive response, I just move on to the next, you know, that's why I, I stick with Sony, Sony as much as I can. They're very organized. You know, they know what they have in the archives, you know, Philly international, they know exactly what they have. I, I got something a few weeks ago. No problem. Approved. So got right now do you have, do you have, uh -huh. I think the process easily because you, you got a reputation, you prove the concept. You need to prove, okay, I can do that. Uh, you show your, okay, you work your, as a professional. So the guys, okay, uh, you can uh, go easily uh, the, using Sony, for instance. I, you know what? It's tougher to convince my my vinyl distribution people, you know, on the idea than it is to Sony. I mean, Sony, I go to them, yeah, you want to do that? Okay, let's do it. You know, but the vinyl, the distribution guys, they're looking at it from the how many are we going to sell? How many of this same title is out now in a reissue or this and that? So they're looking more of the dollar and cents. Me, I'm just like, I just want to do it. And, you know, you tell me so you want to press it up, then we'll do it. It's more challenge. It's more challenge uh, to make deals with the vinyl distributors. You, you mean? know what? It's not even difficult. It's just, it's more, there's maybe one or two more emails that have to go back and forth before they say, yeah, you know what? Let's do it. So it really hasn't been that difficult lately. So I'm going to knock on wood. You know, it hasn't been that difficult lately, doing it the way I'm doing it. So I, I recall your early days starting something, uh, trying to license something. Is it still uh, a licensing a nightmare or depends? It's it's for me right now. It's not really a nightmare. Yeah. You know, it's you know, I have a, a good guy in the U.S. at Sony. I got a good guy, you know, in the U.K. The licensing really isn't a problem. Uh, right now for that i mean obviously if you want to go out and try and deal with bmg you know they are more difficult to deal with why i have no idea everybody on the planet has south soul multi-tracks they might as well take the mixes and put them out and and i don't ask for much i just like doing it so you know I'm, whatever i don't ask for anything yeah so it's like they don't want to do it they don't want to deal with me for whatever reason they heard or they you know they got somebody got in their ear 
Hey, listen, Sony's got plenty of vaults that I can dig through, so. Yes. Um, let's talk about your uh, bestseller, probably, if I'm not wrong. Let's talk about your triple CD release in the, uh, on Harmless in early 2015. It's about, uh, we're talking about the Mike Mauro, the PK Hour remix. Probably your number one in sale performance in po popularity, right? Am I correct? Yeah, that, yeah, that well, yeah, as far as CD goes, that that was a bestseller on, on Amazon, like months before it even came out. It was a number one bestseller on, on there. So I, there was a lot of anticipation. Oh, you must so be proud. You must be proud. I mean, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't really see much of the numbers after the first couple of years when, you know, it started to slow down. But I, I mean, I'm guessing they, they must have sold, you know, I don't know what's a good number. They must have sold 5,000 of them. Maybe yeah, at the uh, time that was a good number. I don't know. Yes, but I would like to understand, uh, tell us about, about the, that journey uh, from initial insights to until created the release and distribution and the popularity. Uh, what about that journey? It was how we start talking about the, that journey. It started from the beginning, your insight, thinking about, okay, it was uh, your initial idea, create a triple wow. CD, uh, talking about that that project itself. That that wasn't my, my idea with this whole thing was just to remix stuff, you know, oh, wow, I got some multi-tracks. Remix them, put them on SoundCloud and let people enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I got, I was contacted by Ian Dewhurst, you know, he was at Harmless and, you know, he just asked me, what do you have? And I told him what I had and I sent him a bunch of stuff and he kind of came up with the idea because they had done uh mixology. Harmless did a couple of CDs under the mixology heading or whatever. I think they did a Sal Soul and they did, uh, I forgot what the other one was. It was Sal Soul and maybe, I don't think it was Sam Records. It was. There was South Soul and another one under Mixology, and they can and they kind of used the same graphic concept, and you know they came up with you know basically it was Ian's idea most of it. You know I just got Brian Chin to do the liner notes. You know I contacted him, he did that for me, and you know I needed Paul Simpson's help to kind of smooth over a you know a, a licensing thing with 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 Asher and Simpson. And other than that, it just took time to get the clearances from the from the different labels because everything was on a different label. Some Warner, some Sony, you know, some Sal Soul, and you know, like Warner Brothers, you couldn't have more than a certain percentage of the tracks on the album be other label. It was some weird stuff, but Ian took care of it. I just busted his chops every other day. You know, when's it coming? When's it coming? When's it coming? But other than that, he did most of the legwork. You know. Yes, I can understand. I can imagine it. your first experience uh, making deals or uh, knowing or get information about the process itself, uh, licensing stuff, a lot of stuff. It was your first experience uh, making deals with the record label, right? You know what? Making the deal was Ian sent me the paperwork and I wanted to do it after he talked it up so much. I wanted to do it so bad. I, he sent me the paper. I, I didn't look at it. I signed it. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you so, know it wasn't even a business decision it was nothing it was just like yeah i want to do it let's get it done you know and he did it so yeah, now i'm a little he, i'm a little smarter now but not much yeah, so but <laughs> probably it, it was a great experience it's a kind of oh, when yeah. you look back it's a kind of okay uh, lessons learned right you learned a lot uh, in the past so after that you create some experience skills you improve your skills uh, mixing, working with the kind of different processes to release something professionally. It was a great experience. I can understand. And um, how important was that release for your career? Uh, new deals, relationship with the music industry, talking about how important was that first experience? Well, you know, that was the, that was the most important one because it, it put me on the map legitimately you know, a legitimate label release. And I mean, you look at a lot of the guys that are doing remixes or have been doing them. I mean, a lot of them did never got that opportunity, you know? So I, it was a big, you know, it's a big label. Harmless was a big label. It was a BBC company, you know, it was, uh, you know, uh, demon music, which is a huge company. So it was, it was pretty much a big deal. I mean, you know, things moved slowly after that to get where, you know, what I'm doing now, but it, it was getting your foot in the door. 
you know, and that's basically what it did, you know, and now I kind you know, I have a name, I guess, and, you know, I could kind of get myself, you know, noticed if I want to do something, I get a response, I notice, you know, when I normally wouldn't, so it put me, uh, it put it on the map, basically. I have a question, uh, did you use that uh, experience, like a CV, your curriculum, uh, uh, that experience, to have you share that experience and uh, when you start in talk with Sony or it was it was a completely different approach because to me it's a kind of okay I did that's the proof I can do that I can deliver no well what happened was after that you know that's when I kind of hooked up with Reed, with Reed you know Tom actually put me in touch with Reed and Reed kind of took over doing the deals and getting the licensing he was like the in-between me and the labels so he took care of that for a while but like just recently with the philly international compilation that i did a, a couple of years ago maybe for the 50th anniversary uh, yes yes i didn't they came to me you know the, my my guy at sony in the u.s jeff james if you're listening thank you but he reached out to me and was like, you know, what do you got? We're looking to do this. We're looking to, and like I before that, I really wanted to be part of the Philly, the 50th. And yeah, I just so didn't know how proud. to go about it. When you received that, that call, okay. You are I didn't know how to go about happy. it. You know, I talked to Paul and I was like, wow, you know, it would be great if I could get a, a 12 inch single out for the 50th anniversary. And then I get an email from Jeff asking you know what do you got and i was like oh i got this 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 it was like it was like 25 tracks i gave them and they narrowed it down to the 17 or 18 that they used but yeah i mean i didn't have to do anything he contacted me and actually after that everything else really steamrolled even faster yes uh that that, that was my uh next question it's about the philadelphia international rex the mike Morrow remix uh when you starting uh when the sunny call you okay let's do that you you send uh, some uh, those kind of mix for sunny uh do do you have more from a philly uh out of this project uh for the future or something uh, not approved it? probably you have more right uh i mean i have a lot of multi-tracks Mm -hmm. Philly International. I mean, I, as far as stuff to release, not, not, not that I've really done. I mean, that was basically like the meat of what I had, feel, like my favorite stuff that I've done on Philadelphia mm -hmm. International was on that album. So there's maybe a handful that were, you know, never used or I haven't done anything with yet. But, you know, for the most part, that was like my favorite stuff on there. So uh, maybe that multi tracks uh, you got from Sonny, Sonny uh transfer from the master tapes and put some of them the, yes some of them some of them i had some of them they gave me oh great great it's a, a bit, uh is there some um, some idea to release something uh, using that uh, uh additional uh, stuff because i think the philly international remix is a success successful uh, projects everybody involved in disco love philly do you have some plans to release something using that uh, additional stuff? Well, I've, I've been. I mean, I had the uh, uh, the OJ. I think the OJ's I Love Music. I'm not sure if the OJ's was I Love Music was on that album. Like, I did that one. I think so. Was it? I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have another OJ's 12-inch that I'm working on now. And, you know, they weren't on there. You know, one of them's a new mix. One of them I had on the shelf. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, that's uh, used to be my girl and darling, darling, baby. I'm doing that on a vinyl. So that wasn't used on the album. I have a mix of The Intruders. I'll Always Love My Mama that I never put out. Yeah. Unfortunately. And Gene uh, Karn, too. I have Gene Karn. I think I have a mix of okay. what that all was that I never put out. So there's a handful. Yeah, probably first or the second album. I think it's fine. But uh, speaking about the Philly stuff, uh, I, unfortunately, there is a lot of this stuff you can never, you don't have master tapes, no records, no multi tracks. A lot of the most from the single releases only at the time, not album tracks. Them single tracks like a kaleidoscope, stuff like that. It's a yeah, beautiful yeah. word. Hey, Jane Negron, you love it, right? <laughs> But unfortunately, uh, a lot of things uh, they lose, right? Lose or we don't know. The fire destroy a lot. Uh, we don't know. 
do, do you have some information about the possible uh, uh, master tapes available or something like that? Because as I know, uh, long time ago, we had the fire on the vaults, right? In the Philadelphia. They lose a lot of the master tapes at that time. I think this. I, you know what? I, as far as what they lost, I, I've only heard what, you know, but they, they seem to have a lot of them. I mean, there really hasn't been much that I've asked them for that they haven't been able to locate. So, I mean, you know, I know I'm sure there's some stuff that Tom and Jay, you know, that they know that I don't know, but for the Man, most part, it's a scene. It's a scene. When you see something like that, okay, they lose, but. To me, at the time, probably nobody is was concerned about or worried about, okay, let's preserve that. Let's take care about this. Maybe when you look back, okay, for now, it makes sense to talk about that stuff. I don't know if those guys were concerned about, okay, let's preserve it very well to take care about that quality. It's, about, it's for the life, but I don't know. Uh, we have that problem right now. Well... Uh, let's talk about your partners in crime right now, Pro providing mixes, ed editing, remastering. Again, Jay Negron, Florida, Donna Cleave, Johnny D, Tommy Musto, Paul Simple, etc. Anybody else you want to highlight? Uh, yeah, I mean, I you know, I've I've worked, you know, DJ Spinner has done stuff. Oh, a the Vincent, things. yeah, mm -hmm. that guy, it's amazing. I forgot to mention. Sure. DJ forgive Spinner, me. forgive me. <laughs> Uh, well, Ralphie Rosario was a great guy. He did, you know, something. For, he did two things for me. Um, yeah, really. I try to, I try to keep a small circle. You know, Paul did some stuff for me. It's, and... a, it's a, a kind of the yeah. It's a part in crimes. Like a, you're a dream team, right? Yeah, <laughs> you want to say that? <laughs> you know, Johnny. Johnny's done. You know, a couple. We've been doing a couple of you know, you know, independent yeah. kind of release things me and johnny you know, i got a couple of other things i still have to find a, another u.s kind of pressing guy because the guy i was using for the uh for the leon ware and for the frankie valley they kind of disappeared love that. So. <laughs> right it came to california it, it's amazing mix i love that from johnny That's johnny's got plenty johnny's got plenty of ideas so all right good never ending you, supply of ideas yeah your circle it's a quality right a quality circle uh, friends and, and uh, that kind of friendship and partnership it's very important to build something valuable uh, okay about the licensing i think you you we start running the brooklyn and queens the music production you told me in the probably this week you created that company to to managing or work with the licensing is this correct talking about why you created that the brooklyn queens music production yeah but you know what basically it was just you know it was basically just to separate the you know separate the music from my personal okay business that's all it really was you know it's your business presentation right yeah, I mean, it looks a little nicer, you know, that you have like an actual company set up. And, you know, a lot of the little, ma you know, the majors I heard at the time, like, you know, they wanted to deal with somebody who had an actual company. Okay. Instead of, you know, just, hey, I'm. You need, to, you need to formalize, to formalize yeah. something to support the deals, right? You cannot sign something. I'm a Mike Maurer, like a personal, the, you need the, the company, right? Well, everything I signed basically is, I signed it, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, it was just a place to put the, put the, the checks, you know, it was just a, another place to put the checks besides my, yeah, my you're, personal. You're, stuff. you're the C, <laughs> CEO of this company. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm the only, I'm the only employee, so I guess I could be anything. So it doesn't matter. No, you play, you play our roles, right? You... Yeah, I'm the janitor too. <laughs> I sweep the floors. Yes. Okay. It's still uh, about your uh, sales performance. Uh, where are you customers in general? Tell about based on your stats or insights you got from the, the, the vendors like distributors. Where are your customers in general? Europe, mostly Europe, Europe, uh, Netherlands, you know, UK, 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 France, okay. Netherlands, uh, Germany, you know, um, yeah, around yes. Italy. Well, uh, you, you also, you have some, okay, you have uh, in Americas, like in Brazil stuff. The problem is a lot of guys uh, want to, to, go, to get to buy your stuff, 
but sometimes the shipping cost is too much. So it's uh, basically it's forbidding, right? <laughs> it's impossible it, so it, for, it's... for the most of the, the, the simple people to get your stuff. It's why people ask, Mike, can you deliver something in, in digital stuff? Because how do you see that? Is it okay? Because the shipping, okay, believe it or not, it, it's a problem for a lot of people. It because is a problem. Sometimes you, you CD, okay, you CD, okay, it's uh, 20 euros, something like that. But the, the shipping, it's 100. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm trying, I'm working to try, you know what? A lot of places I contact, they don't, you know, I, I from here, I contacted stores in the UK and they, they're like, eh, CDs, you know, we really don't want to deal with CD. You know, the vinyl over here, like forget from Juno to send it here is expensive. So it's kind of hard to, it's, it, you know, it's not worldwide. That's yes. the problem, you know? So it's like, I don't, it's not that kind of a thing where it's worldwide. So it's, you know, I have to pick my battles. So, you know, for the vinyl I do in the UK and whoever really wants it here, they'll buy it. Or eventually some of them will trickle over here and they'll buy them on like a secondary market, you know, or Discogs or eBay or whatever. Yeah, well, sometimes I, mean... I get, you know, certain yeah. ones I'll get copies, you know, 20, like the Frankie Valley that we did, I got, you know, a box worth of copies, you know, and I'll just sell them on my Discog store so the U.S. guys could buy them. That, that one actually I had pressed here and in the U.K. I so, think uh, uh, I think the Europe, it's a it's a OK, your biggest market. Maybe yeah, maybe it makes sense to make a deal with the distributor or something like a record store like the Soul Brother or something. Not the big store because the guys is not a, a word about that. But uh, there's a lot of the in the UK mostly. Uh, there's a there's a lot of the the uh, opportunities because I know a lot of guys still selling CDs, vinyl and stuff like so Brother Records or uh, some some store like that. I don't know, but maybe if it's possible, create something to represent Mike Morrow in, in the Europe. Yeah. I think it's good. You know, honestly, I just haven't had the, the time. I mean, I go right to like Juno, like, you know, they sell a mm -hmm. lot of my stuff. So I go right to Juno and they kind of like, well, you know, especially like, you know, underground CDs, you know, <laughs> underground. They, well, they sell a lot of products for major labels. So they don't want to get involved mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know. So, I mean, I just really haven't had the time to really dive into it. So, OK, let's talk about your CD release. You put on the Disco GES website. A lot of people from Brazil ask me, Rob, so can you help them this? Because I cannot, Mikey is not able to ship something for Brazil. Brazil, it's not a jungle, right? It's a real, real deal. You, <laughs> have, know, a lot if, of fan, you have a lot of fans in Brazil. Talking, it, it, talking it, about it, this situation for the guys. Yeah, it was just, you know what it was? It was just, uh, you know, I, had, I had to redo my, sh my Discog shipping uh, grid. What, and I, it just happened. I went in when I saw that message today, and I went in there. And I was like, "Oh wow!" You know, I yeah, didn't it's even my realize. friend, Ricardo. It's my friend. Ask it. Ask myself to. Okay, ask it. Try to help me on this because I want to buy the record, but the ship is not available for Brazil. Yeah, for wow, some what reason. Happened? Yeah, for some reason, I didn't have South America and Central America clicked off as regions that I shipped to. I mean, uh, you, you you put Brazil, South America, off this planet, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I fixed it now. They can go on if they want. I fixed ah, it. Ah, cool. Let's see. Let's do with that. Okay, uh, let's move it to the the surprise. Talking about the Mike Maurer as a collector, as mm. addicted, because the guy sometimes <laughs> has a ten piece of the same twelve single, <laughs> believe it or not. And about the Harrods, I would like to to understand how how do you start collecting, and uh, right now how many items do you think you have on these boxes? Ah. Uh... Well, Good I question. know for a fact down here, my my personal like stuff that I don't sell, I don't take out. There's probably around ten thousand pieces. How how do you organize the records? It's by letter, uh, alphabetic stuff, or style, or year. How do you organize your your records? I, I I do it alphabetically. I know a lot of people they like to have the all the same company jackets lined up in a row, and I just I alphabetically i mean it just works for me yeah it's a, but uh okay but uh, do you have a a, a, a digital representation using yeah. the database on the to make sure one thing okay okay i have this but where is it 
Ah, okay. One by one, sometimes it takes time, right? You you, you can you can check on a database. Okay, I have that in the second box. Something. No, like I know that. I know where everything is. Okay. I don't need that, that. I don't I don't need the computer. I know where everything is in here. <laughs> you check physically one by one, right? You you got it. <laughs> I know exactly where. That's not even an issue. I mean, I have them cataloged on Discogs because sometimes when I'm at work yes. and I'm on my computer and I see something and I'm like, do I have how many of those do I have? And I'll look and oh, I got two of those, you know. So I was, you know, I, that's the only reason I use the Discogs collection just to see when I'm not around what I have, what I don't have. Yes, I ha I have a question about the the Disco G uh, GS website because uh, months ago, if I'm not wrong. I, I heard, I saw a message of you trying to buy collections. And right now, you are trying to sell something. What happened? Sometimes you, you want to buy collections. Right now, you, you try to, se to sell something. What, what's the scenario right now? <laughs> well, that's what, I, you know, that's what I do, you know, in spare time type of business thing. I'll just buy a big collection and I'll just take what I want to sell and I'll get rid of the rest of it. I mean, I have a Discog store. That's basically stuff that... I bought from other DJs or other collectors and I decided to sell this amount of stuff so, for my so, own stuff. I so, don't sell this stuff. Ah, uh, okay. So the per it's a, it, you separate this stuff. You separate your personal collections, not for selling, right? And yeah, that's a this... business. It's, a, it's another little business I got going on. It's, ah, I just okay. sell okay. CDs and stuff. So I'll buy okay. a collection and I'll break it down and sell it. And, you know, it's, it's another okay. little money maker. Yes, the se the second business is the, that kind of business, like a second hand store, right? You yeah, got like you, you buy store. and sell. The buy and sell. That's it. Basically, and, it's an online record store. That's it. Okay, but your personal collection, okay, it's a completely private, not for selling, right? For the most part, I mean, you know, if somebody if somebody makes you a ridiculous offer for something, you have to at least entertain <laughs> it. But you know, for the most part, I don't sell any of this stuff, and you know. Okay, What's let's talk about uh, your surprise you have for the audience right now. It's about the acetates. I would like to to see the kind of stuff. I think you manage it. You sort something for the people, right? Yeah, you know what? Because I had I did this five minutes before we started, so I didn't I didn't grab I couldn't think so fast, but I grabbed a little stack of some interesting stuff and then some of my favorite okay. items. Let's do it. Let's the showcase. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So here you got this is a test pressing of uh, Peach Boys. Don't make me wait. Uh, mail sharing. Uh, uh, yes. It, can you uh, see it? Yes, I can see. It. Yes, yes, yes. Use that. Use that approach. That that position. It works. What else? Good. Good one. All right. Let's see. So that's one. It, it's this test pressing version. It's the same mix. Uh, the yeah, commercial mix or different one. So a lot of them are the same mix. It's just a an advanced a test pressing where they made, you know, you know, they press 10,000 of the regular one. They press maybe 10 of these. Oh, okay, cool. So it's, very it's, it's a lot yeah. rarer. And, yeah, it's very rare. So here, this one here is, this is a test pressing of Play at Your Own Risk. Planet Patrol, Play at Your Own Risk, Arthur Baker. Yeah, it's very hairy, right? The yeah. Arthur Baker stuff, man. That one there. Let's see. This this one here is an this is an acetate uh, jelly bean, the Mexican. Ah, great! Okay, it's the it uh, was uh, from the Frank Ford Wayne. It's the it's the one of the the main the main company responsible to remaster for Sigma Sound, right? The most Frank Ford Wayne, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was Herb Powers. Herbie Powers did this one. Yes, great. All right, let's see another test pressing here. This is uh, yeah, Janus McLean, smack dab in the middle. It's a classic garage. Mm -hmm. It's absolute. It's it's uh, that classic was released by Ray Caviano RFC, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the U. Yeah, the U.S. It was definitely. If it was any place else, I don't remember. This here is a U.K. These were like one of the most sought after twelve inches for a while. This is a hijack, a U.K. twelve inch promo, a Herbie Man hijack. Yeah, it's a. It's a was a. It's it was huge. At the time, this was for a while. Time. For a while, collectors were going crazy looking for that one. Yeah, right, let's see. This one here, this is this is the thank God it's Friday. This is the ten disc promo with the poster. I never, I, I never saw that to be honest. In yeah, it's ten. There was a gift that they gave out to the DJs. It's ten singles, 
This one's sealed. Basically, uh, basically uh, all tracks uh, in, in 12 singles or uh, the few ones, like Love and Kisses or uh, The yeah. Summer. The, yeah, the, most, the most... Basically, the Casablanca cuts. Ah, the Casablanca, yeah. Yeah, because there was some Motown stuff on this. There was some Diana Ross on there and, and the Commodores, but they didn't put them on the 12 inch. These are just the, the 10, 12 inch with like Last Dance with your love. Steel. It's a, it's a, what? It's a very special stuff. The first time I, I, I see that. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Let's see what else. This here is, yeah. That's an acetate of uh, media sound acetate. Uh, ecstasy, passion, and pain. Touch okay, and so uh, roulette, roulette. Yes. Yeah, that's a, the twelve-inch mix. Uh, love that. Uh, it's amazing. Sigma Sound, Barbara Roy, great song. Let's see what else. This here is another one that people ask me for all the time. This is uh, Captain Sky, Moonchild on a on a promo twelve-inch. Oh, the, a the AVI, uh, absolutely beautiful. I know a lot of guys that go crazy for this one here for some reason. Yes. I think uh -huh. the AVI it's uh, owned by Universal, right? AVI, by AVI is owned by Universal. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this here you really can't see. This is this I got from Reed, from his cult, from his records he gave me. This is a, uh, an acetate of Helplessly, the twelve inch mix of ha Helplessly that was on Sal Soul. Ooh, but it's from a uh, Red White Lot or not? Yeah, yeah, that was from his collection. Uh, we are gonna talk about that uh, late, guy. All right, so this one here is uh, this is the mo this one's moment of truth. So much for love, acetate. I know they're hard to see, but okay, probably it's that is that mix is the same uh, the one released it or special mix? Yeah, this is the same one. This is the the six minute mix, and then I got the single mix on the other side. Oh, the special mix is the one mixed by Tom Malta. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, let's see. This one here is. Uh, this one here is uh, the, the acetate of uh, the bottle, Gil Scott Heron, the bottle, the 12 inch version that was on Arista. Yeah, classic song, classic song. Different mix or the no, same? same thing? It's the same, it's the same as the Arista 12 inch, mm -hmm. just on an acetate. All right. Why did you go to the, the most of the test pressing on the web, Disco GS? What, what? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Found some, some of them I found over the years, but most of them I, I bought mm -hmm. when it was convenient. Uh, this one here is another one that they go crazy for. This is a Pink Floyd, a radio sampler of the wall, which uh, it's it goes for crazy money. I mean, if you can find it, it you know, it's just a sampler, it's a radio station sampler. Uh, I have seen a lot of the, the Pink Floyd releases. Special for the Dark Side of the Moon is uh, is getting uh, the the Dark Side of the Moon have a new release to celebrate the 50th anniversary. It's a yeah, lot of the package. That. A lot of the package. This one here is is they they want this one because you know how the the wall the the songs they segue into the next one on the album. Yeah. These here are the radio versions, so some of them a little the intros are a little different. They don't segue from one to the other. They're it's it's for the radio because it's not the uh, it's not the continuous. Yeah, exactly. It's, like oh. a, it's split it to play in radios. I never I, because that's a, that's the challenge to, to run something like a Glory Gainer, Never Can Sing Goes By, that LP. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to play, right? Yeah, so that's why they did this. So that's hard, pretty hard to get. But uh, uh, what was the approach? The fade out. On yeah, the cut, they, the fade yeah they, they use the original intro and then they faded them out for the radio. Oh, okay. The intro yeah. is what the thing because they, you know what I mean? You could actually hear the real intros. Uh, first time I see that. That's amazing. Uh, this one here is another one that was sought after for a while. Deborah Law is very special on a 12 inch. Ooh, but yeah, that, I, ne I never saw the 12 inch. Same album mix or a different one? Same mix. Just on to get it on a 12 inch is impossible. Yeah, yeah, I, got my, I don't I got know about it. <laughs> I got my my double copies of that one. Uh, let's see, I got two it, more. No, it's it's a double copy. You have a big copy, right? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> this one here is another one that's you, this is sealed from from 1975. This is sealed. This is a, the low rider, 12 inch from War. Yes, I, I, I never I, saw I, it. Yeah, sealed. The, I mean, I've had this thing sealed for for 15 years. I haven't opened it. No, it's not yeah. a mite. It's a seal, right? It's amazing. I had so many people ask me about that one. And then this one too is a 12 inch side effect always there. I think you have copy. a problem. If Johnny D. Yeah. 
it's watching you you have a problem next day right or maybe tomorrow maybe later today okay i'm gonna call her mike don't <laughs> not much not much later probably in a couple of minutes i'll probably hear from <laughs> But that's basically that's that's some of my favorite stuff that I just managed to grab and and with the quickness. Do you have some uh, real to real or master tape relevant stuff to 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 show? You know what I do. They're just not right here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to probably. Yeah, I didn't have much time. I like I said, I got home a little close to the you know. Mm -hmm. Not close to the cutoff there, so I didn't really get a chance to grab but, any of that. Stuff. I'm sure you have, no problem. But uh, I would like to, to, to see something special. Well, uh, we are almost there. Uh, as you shown, you you share your stuff, uh, including those uh, moments of truth stuff. And uh, I would like to talk about your relationship because I was wanted to know how you meet the Raid White Law, the later White Law. The guy was responsible to create Mom of Truth, Ralph Carter, and the Turner. The Turner original soundtrack, yes. It, I love the Heaven Hell Orchestra. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. What you're gonna do? And uh, yes, uh, I think they work with the, his partnership, the Norman, right? Norman yes. Bergen, yeah? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Talking about uh, your, how did you meet with the, what? How? What about your approach to meet Red White Love? What? What uh, you 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 make this happen? Well, actually, you know what? Actually, Tom made it happen because Tom was dealing with Reed on his Philly regrooved CDs, and he kind of just said, "Oh, do you want to work with Mike?" You know, and he kind of just introduced me to him, and that was it. You know, and then I just I had a really good relationship with Reed. We, you know, we talk. You know, not Wait, only about what? music. When did, you, times when did you when did you meet that guy one year back uh, because i think a uh, month after they uh, he passed away right no i met him i met him back in 2017 maybe uh, okay no a long time 16. ago yeah. yes because he's the one who put out you know i had that series of 12 inches with for the mike morrow peak hour mixes 12 inches i did there was like six of them they came out they were cuts from my album so it was right after my so it was probably 2016 I met him and he was responsible for do you know getting the heat wave mixes done and you know he introduced me to the people at uh, Philly Groove the people who own Philly Groove now and he's kind of set that relationship up so yeah he you know he he what, helped me out a lot what what about that the person the the, uh, the raid personality because uh well I I never saw that guy but uh, easy guy good guy humble guy easy guy He's a, a very good guy, very business, you know, he's all business. You know, he didn't care how bad, you know, I, how bad I wanted to do something. If it didn't make sense to him, he wasn't going to, you know, he didn't want to get involved. You know, me, but now I'm more like, you know, I just want to do it. If it break, makes money, beautiful. If it breaks even, I'm happy, you know, so, but he wanted to make money. So. Okay. Uh, speaking about uh, that the moment of truth, you release it okay for the guys i'm going to talk about uh, the the website when you can uh, grab or buy uh, the limited limited edition for the moment of truth and the ralph carter uh, but before talking about uh, that source i would like to play a surprise if you buy the cd you can find it's a kind of the easter egg it's a, a, a surprise it's a hidden track i would like to play some uh, seconds uh, let's do that one minute. Let me share the sound one minute. Okay, let's share the sound. It's correct. Uh, let me play the stuff. Okay, that's it. Let's hear. <laughs> Soul Sessions, Best of Soul. Help me sleep, I'm all locked up in a memory, baby. I'm crying, help me sleep, you hold the key to my happiness, baby. Baby, I was wrong. <laughs> okay.
Okay, if you want more, please check the website. The Disco GS stuff, the, the mic has a, a website with a lot of the great stuff. You can select the items, so you can ship. Mike pr promise, right? You can ship for every place of this planet, right? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it's a great word. Uh, yes, uh, you can check a lot of stuff. The catalog, the cool release, the fans from Brazil. Okay, Mike has fixed the problem. And uh, finally, let's talk about your projects. What are you thinking about that for the coming period, for this year or for next year? What are you thinking about? What's about your planning? Okay, since my since my battery is starting to get a little low here, so I'll do it real quick. I have yes, uh, I have an OJ's twelve. I have, first of all, I have a Teddy Pendergrass twelve inch uh, only you and close the door coming out in March. I have uh, Breakwater No Limit colored vinyl. Looking for that that uh, brick wart it sounds great, right? That's, That's for Record right. Store Day in April. That's but a Record Store Day release. Are you thinking about? Uh, do you have an idea to to or thinking about the uh, promoting that 12 single for the uh, Record Day store in the UK because it it's a huge. The, the, the yeah, that's that's yeah, that's pretty much where it's geared to. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then I have uh, I have another series that we're doing with Sony, just some stuff from that Remix Vault album uh, that we're going to do five or six, 12 inches from that album. Kenny Burke, Michael Wyckoff, Melba Moore, uh, Phyllis Hyman, uh, Harvey Mason, all of those, you know, or the Archie Bell and the Drells. That's all going to be on 12 inch in the, you know, probably by the summer. Or the Archie Bell and the Drells. That's all going to be on 12 inch. Yes. The, uh, probably by the summer. One minute. Let me check. Um, Let me check some questions from our uh, comments. I will highlight something. Uh, the if, Joe, if, the... If, if you want, if you got one second, I could plug in because I'm really low on power. Okay. You got one second? No, no, I cannot. I cannot uh, lose your connection. Please do it. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Okay, the mic is using the battery. The battery is gone. Almost there. So uh, some... Uh... Yes. I'm going to check the messages. One minute. Okay. All right, we're good. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, no problem. Well, I have some comments. Some uh, The first of all, the Joe Demente, right? Oh, boy. Joe Demente talking about, okay, the Jim Kern awesome mix. Uh, Max Mamedi, it's my big friend in Brazil, the DJ, good guy. Clap his hands. Uh, my man is talking about, okay, it's expensive. Sometimes the CD is not delivered in Brazil. Well, you have the problem. It's another problem. It's about the logistics. Sometimes uh, the, the CD, uh, okay, they deliver broke, broken CDs or stuff like that. It, it, it sucks. You create a lot of expectations. Okay, you pay for that. But in the end, the postal service uh, cannot do a, a good job. So that's the problem. Yeah, it's uh, Philip West talking about the Peach Boys. What a tune. The Jane Groom, hi Jay. Love the way the streams came out on the moment of true. I do. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. amazing. I have the same comments. Let me check more, uh, more messages. Okay. Let me check on the, 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 the Facebook. The Facebook. Oh, man. Let me check. Okay, do that. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, I have more questions. Let's see. Uh, Jane Groom. One minute. Uh, yes, uh, Jane Groom. Uh, message Mike when the question from Jay. Mike, when is Down to Love Town, Babe from Originals, coming out? Uh, no, no, uh, no, 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 no excuses. The J, uh, I, I promise, no, I promise I'll work on it. No, 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 <laughs> it's a respectful guy, right? <laughs> yeah, he's been, that's one he's been, bug, he's been bugging me about for years. I just, I started playing around with it and I just never went back to it for some reason. I don't know. Okay, I see I'll a get message. get to it, I promise. Uh, I, I, I have a message from the David. The David, okay. it's uh, a.k.a. the Aka Baron von Groove Funkel. 
Do you know oh, that guy, okay. right? All it's right. a oh, dead, yeah. it's a talent guy. The uh, the message is I I I've heard it's said that the music of yesterday gets closer to being forgetting uh, with each passing day. And the uh, counter this I, I read that old music outsells new music. What is your what is your personal opinion on the importance of the old music and the how does this influence the business decisions with the labels? It's a question from the David. Big shout, David. Well, you know, the major labels, the major labels don't think as much of the old stuff as we do. You know, they're they're mostly into the next the next big thing. You know, a lot a lot of this music that we love and it's your know, it's our lives, it's been kind of pushed to, you know, like another part of the, the 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 business. Like now it's catalog. You know what I mean? It's like it's considered old news, but they'll just dabble in it just to make some people happy. But you know, I I, I just think that the old music it, it it'll never go away. I mean, we it's 50 years later and we're still talking about the OJs. You know, but I can't remember who, you know, I can't remember who had a number one song on Billboard, you know, from last year, you know, so it's just staying power. Motown, yeah, it's, it's a lot Billy of the staying power. Yeah, it's a, I see a lot of the volatile. It's uh, in the past, you got the LP or 12 inch, you it, it was possible to love five tracks, for instance, five or the, the entire album. Nowadays, it's a basically impossible it's to be consumed very quickly. It's the discarded, uh, the, uh, it's, it's not good, right? There, you know, no, there's a short attention span. People have a short attention span now. Young people, it's, you know, instant gratification and what's next. You know, they don't, you know, this stuff here, we enjoy it. We you analyze it, you remix it, you listen to it, you enjoy it over and over again. It's like once something's done now, it's on to the next thing. And, you know. But at the same time, I'm not sure if you have read on the media, I think that Taylor Swift has delivered the LP. It's not about the content, right? The stuff, but about the behavior. Because it's the first time since Michael Jackson sell it more LP than CDs. At the time, the Michael Jackson a bad album. Mm -hmm. And right now, the Taylor Swift has beat the, the, the CD sales and the vinyl his performance very well a long time ago maybe uh, no, it's because do, do, that, do you believe that, it's some a new wave for the vinyl stuff because they, i mean they're making i mean they're making it so they're making it almost like it's it's a fad or they're making it almost like it's a like they're toys like you see these new turntables they're like little toys you know it's a, i don't know it doesn't feel the same it, and you know what that taylor it, swift it, that taylor swift album tied up the pressing plants that nobody could get anything pressed because they were all pressing Taylor Swift. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Mike Morrow. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, maybe you are correct. Maybe the guys as eyes are moving to the turn tips like a toy, not that not using the passion like we did in the past, like like a technical stuff. Okay, it's a like of the gift. A big toy, it's the the hype. Like a hype, right? Something like that. L listen. Have you ever listened to an album? I, I bought a stereo, a little turntable set for my nephew for, for Christmas. And he went and he had an ACDC album, put the ACDC. Have you ever listened to music on one of these toy stereo? It's it's horrendous. It's not like the days when my old man back in the day, he had a hi-fi system. He had clips, horn speakers. You know, the stuff I got here is, you know, pretty decent, but... Yeah, it's it's disc it doesn't do any of the music justice. I don't. Uh, maybe I can't some, keep buying uh, an album and playing it on there. It's uh, ridiculous. Maybe some. Uh, it's a good discussion. Good discussion. Uh, maybe my son. Uh, my son loves. Uh, okay, maybe it's uh, my son. It's a uh, heritage. My DNA because okay, uh, he's is looking forward to get my techniques and MK2. I have in Brazil. I live in Brazil. Okay, uh, father, Pat, daddy, I want this. The, the I want to play my LPs. On your turntable okay it's a it's a it's a legacy on my case I, i'm not put pressure on that guy but it's a kind of heritage maybe because he used it to see my records in my discussions my live interviews a lot of that and uh, well maybe but i agree some kind of hype on this particular subject right yeah, and it's it's almost like it's you know you're not cool now if you don't have one of these little turntables and you're on your kitchen counter or so you know i just you know <laughs> 
I, you know, I don't, I don't see it. It's, it <laughs> sounds horrible it. to me. It sounds horrible. These okay. new records, they, they sound just as bad as the new CDs, most of them. So I don't know. I just so, think uh, it's not for a, me. A quick message from the DC from Brooklyn, the Donut. Hello, guys. Okay. DC, good guy. Love you. Uh, a message from the David Key D. Ewer McLean. Mike, your mix on the Ambrosia, big parts of me. What's a beautiful one of my favorites? Yeah, it's, it's a kind of the, uh, the the yacht rock. I love Ambrosia, those kind of thing. Uh, do you want to talk about that mix? Uh, why do you did that? Uh, what the, what your feeling about? Do you like Ambrosia? It, I loved it. You know what? It was something that I, I had on my drive that I just I never heard anybody mix. So I was just like, you know, what? let me take a stab at it. It was, you know, it's a great song. I just it was just I was in the mood for it that day. I think it's a it was a big time. Uh, recently, I published a, a video, uh, a production created by BBC in um, the pro producer. I forgot the name, but it was amazing. The, that lady explained. It's a, it's a, was about a long journey involving the golden years for the music. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the late 70s started from 75 in the middle of 70s until early 80s. At that time, the best of the best, the best you can buy, the best you can pay, the loft of the, so the best area for the songwriters, bicentennial in the United States, lot of optimistic environments, the best sound engineer, the best studios, the best sound, the best, the best of the best. So you got a lot of the sound. When you see the sound in the early, the late 70s, like, man, LA, California, lazy, the lays back, laid back, people, a lot of the best of songwriting people, Man, when you see the, the kind of things that, okay, uh, Steely Dan, Christopher Cross, stuff like that, check the quality, Mike, uh, Doobie Brother, Mike McDonald, when you, when you listen, the sound, it's, a, it's almost perfect at the time. At the time, the MTV started the business, running the business in the U.S., man, that particular period was amazing in terms of the quality. The sound was amazing. I never, I never saw, never heard something like that. I, I'm not sure you agree. You agree. Well you know, you know, I honestly, I, that's why I like a lot of the seventies and the early eighties music because the sound just it, tape, it was, you know, a lot of it was tape. Now everything's digital. The nineties, they started with the digital tape. Tape sounds the best. I don't know. For some reason, the tape sounds better than anything else. And a lot of the guys like Steely Dan. Now, Steely Dan is like an outlier because those guys are crazy. You, they was able to create the, the 100 takes to pick up one, right? It's a, the best of the best. J, D, I, 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 I watch an uh, interview, a uh, speech of the Jay Graydon. The guy, the guy said, people, okay, every musician that work with Steely Dean, it's a motherfucker. <laughs> That's, a, a, <laughs> I heard <laughs> from Jay the Grom because, man, the, the drummer, the everything, because it was a challenge. It's a lot of must more, then a master class. The guys, it's the purist, the, the cream of the purist, right? <laughs> Maybe well, you cannot see that situation anymore. <laughs> I, heard, I heard a story about uh, Je Jeff Lynn, the uh, Electric Light Orchestra. The and ELO, yeah, yeah. He, he said that it was so difficult doing that style of music with, with live string players, and because they said the string players were walking out of the room before the take was even done. They finished their part, <laughs> they got up and they were walking out of the room. And he, I mean, he has such a great sound, but he said it was so difficult to work like that because they didn't want to work a minute after they, the last note was played, they were packing up and leaving. And, you know, uh, things that happened behind the scenes. Uh, speaking about that uh, purism, I heard uh, an uh, old story, that's the last one, I promise. Uh, involving the normal Whitfield during the record of the album, uh, the album I forget the the Red White Strikes Again, something like that. The, the Love Don't Live Here Anymore. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, I heard the interview. The guy talking about okay, I did the seventy working almost in the full day, the twenty hours a day in the studio. And the guy uh, did a lot of the guitar riffs or something like that, the guitar takes. Okay, after 
60 takes, the Norman pick up the first one. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> it's a wow. it's a guy. The normal feel what's a great guy. Okay. Wow. Let's continue to the messages. Uh okay. Uh, the Dave the Baron Von Group Funko is staying in power. Yes. The Joe Demant DC Donut Cleaver. Uh okay, Donut Cleaver. The majors prioritize motion picture, TV and the game experience. I and vinyl. Even digital is an annoyance for them. Do you agree? I I think I I feel that. I you know what I I heard that you know from Donald actually that yeah that's that's what they're looking for. They're looking to get their music in movies and in TV and everything else is just yeah, whatever you know. Yeah, uh, you wanna... know. He knows yeah. he knows better than I do. <laughs> that's the guy. The donut he knows a still a uh, new mask from uh, Donald Cleveland. The CD not ID. CD, not ID. You got it? Okay. <laughs> uh, Jane Negron, them. Okay. Joe Demant, uh, uh, Jay Ski. It's why it's a signature of the Jane Negron, the king of edits. Jane Negron, hey, Joe. A uh, lot of more. Uh, more. Let me check. Refresh. Uh, yes. Uh, a lot of messages. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, the Sean Hudson. I'm watching Dress It as a Woman. <laughs> the Sean Hudson. Uh -huh. I'm watching Dress It as a Woman. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay, people from Brazil, Jose Roberto talking about, okay, a lot of guys inviting a lot of guys to watch this and uh, tag it. Tag a lot of the uh, Brazilian guys to watch this session. And uh, Michaela Cruz, looking forward to do that. Uh, Joe Demant, what's up, Mike? Uh, Jane Negron, Disco Police. And uh, Ricardo Rigo, the guy asking for the chipping for Brazil. Uh, friend Hop, asking Mike if the flute of remixes and the redits these days. And asking if it doesn't sync, if it detracts from the original music. Uh, it's, it's about the things you, you, you said, you told in the beginning, about a lot of people create something and, and the change of the things and moving the parts in the beginning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you are losing the the, the, the the original progression, stuff like that. Uh, the worst you... thing you could do, the worst thing you could do, in my opinion, is sync the track to a a steady beat, a steady grid. Just takes the soul out of it. To to me, anyway. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I think it kills the soul of the tr the vibe of the track. Yes. Just quantizing it, making house records out of it. I'm it, like, it, uh, I, I, I had some discussions with the with friends about this. It's a, it's a polemic topics because there are a lot of the DJs. You need, you need to separate the things, DJ and remixers. People used to confuse the things and put it the same on the same bucket, right? But it's not correct. I know a lot of the guys produce something illegally, okay, and they completely change the things to to achieve different audience that's it that's that's the way i see and sometimes i don't know i'm not mention anything to create polemics but i i, I hear something the people are starting offering something for the the majors using the complete strange or bad approach and destroying any possibilities to 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 see or okay the close bait the guys are closing basically are closing the door for the new project because when you when you approach the majors offering something crazy or is it a bad approach they think every every guy on this planet has the same idea is not correct that that no. instead of the helping the guys you are destroying the opportunities basically they the, you know what the people i'm dealing with they seem like they they could weed out what's good and what's you know they're not interested. It's not the way they'll get one bad idea and then they'll tell me, oh, sorry, we're not doing it. I mean, they change the rules, you know, every year. Like recently they started with, you know, sending out stems instead of full multi-tracks, you know, but they change, they change as they go along. They change the rules. And I have a point, question. if my point guy leaves for some reason, it may be harder for me to deal with somebody else who has a different preference, you know, so. Yes, I, I, I have a question. I have some ones. Probably you have some wants to create remix. I have my own. I, uh, my my dream is 
here or listing something created by you for the Bose KX lowdown. Talking about that. Any you know chances? What? Actually, any actually, chances? I actually tried to get that, but supposedly... But it, it, it's from Sony, right? Why not? Yeah, but supposedly somebody else had tried to do it, had gotten it. <laughs> no, no, don't talk about that. <laughs> you, you heard that story, right? <laughs> I know. For and, sure. and, and supposedly Boz Skaggs got, was furious that it was on SoundCloud or whatever. So now that put the kibosh on that. So that's not happening. So, But uh, maybe you can convince the guy, let's do the, the using the correct approach. Respect I mean, if I had any way to... If I had any way to get in touch with them, I mean, I guess I would try, but you know, I, I try and go, I try and I go create, for stuff that's less work. I create something, I boost, I'm going to boost the social media to create a promo, a promo or campaign. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let, why? Let, let, let's move to the Bose Skeks and okay. Call, ask Michael to deliver that because it, I, 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 I'm sure you can, you can kill it. That song, right? Probably. I try. Yeah. Man, when you see that musicians, the, the, the Silk Degrees and the Middle Man, man, David Foster, the Total Guys, and the Mike Mara. I mean, mix. Man, I, can imagine, I can imagine what it Jeff would sound Focara, like. Jeff Focara, percussion, the Jeff Focara, right? Oh, I, man. I, I could hear it now. I could, you know, got some stuff going on in my head about it, but I, you know, I don't think it's going to happen, but I would try. Ah, uh, man, do that, please, for audience. We deserve the one, that. The one we deserve that I really... the Bulls Kags. The one that I really wanted to do that I just can't manage to get a hold of is the David Ruffin "Walk Away from Love." Like that, man, I think. Man, I don't need, talk I about that little... because it's a what to me. To my, my personal opinion for me, it was a game changer. When I when I heard this, as uh, when I was thirteen, I got this melody. It's, I, I, I didn't have uh, any record turntables, but I, I was a, okay, a kid in a party, the private party, big party for the kids, and the people were playing the, a compilation mm. from the disco in Brazil, the hypo. Man, it's a compilation, mixes, it, the cut it, fade in, fade out, the cut it, a lot of things. When I heard for the first time, I got it. That track, the walk weight of love from McCoy, and uh, well, I put I put a picture on the, my Facebook, the songwriter McCoy and the roof at the time. It's amazing track. To me, is what a was a game changer. No, no, is the best. If you ask Rob, so what was about your game changer or the David Roof of walk away for love? It's an amazing song. It's amazing. But uh, oh, okay, uh, don't do in polemics because we know. Somebody did a remix of, uh, for this, but you need to you need to convince the Universal to get the Motown stuff, right? Is there any chance? No, nah, I, I mean I don't. If there's some stuff that went on with Motown and, and with Universal <laughs> and this same person, and I know, you know I know, I know, you know, it kind of uh, didn't let, work out for me. Uh, well, they got this guy. Let's avoid funny. the polemics. Everybody knows you know a lot of people know, but it's not yeah, part so of the, the discussion. I'm a good guy. I'm a humble guy. Okay, uh, the Philip West asks you, can you ask Mike what's been his hardest records he had to remix? It's a good question. What, what the biggest challenge when creating remixes? The, cre the creator, the biggest challenge is getting the, the sound, like the sound quality halfway decent because a lot of, some of them were recorded so poorly that they Harvard? just they sound hard. Like a risky, a Bionic Boogie, I did the mix of Risky Changes and... The multi-track was just sounded horrible. The you know the the condition of the tape sounded horrible. So sometimes like trying to re to revive the sound, you know, the, the quality is what's the hardest. It's a, it's a warning, right? Warning. That was Polydor. Uh, Polydor, so was, yes, I, uh, I'm sure it's Polydor. The first one is a TK. It's a, the first. It's the it's about the Greg Diamond stuff, but it's the same the Bionic book. But to be honest, if you ask me, I don't like the sound even for the. Japanese remaster for the Bionic Book, that album. Mm. The Hot Butterfly, stuff like that. I think it, the, the, the both albums, man, uh, the sound is not great to me. To me. Yeah, I, mean, I like not, this. I mean, the, the first TK, it's a different approach. A TK, Star Cruise, stuff like that. I like that. But I don't like the sound for the Bionic Boogie. The original album, I don't like. But it's and, my and personal you know opinion. Too? Barry White, Barry White must have been a genius behind the board, and because yeah. some of that, if you listen to some of that stuff raw, just from the tape, it's it doesn't really sound that great. But he made it into magic. So, 
Yeah, so in this case, no magic. No magic. For, for the Bionic Boogie, it's impossible to, to, to clean up the thing, to, to create something, to recover the sound, to improve the sound. It's, is it possible or not? Yeah, there's, you know, there's some programs that you could clean up certain noises or certain things from the multi-track that's, you know... But points. you can do that, Mike. Oh, Mike, you can do that using a lot of tools for software, but you lose something. You can yeah. edit in the clean up, but there's a side effects. Yeah, well, mostly it comes no down free to lunch. E no free lunch. It, it comes down to e you know, EQ, like you get clicks in the multi-track. You're going to have to, it's basically an EQ that's going to remove that specific frequency, mm -hmm. but you're going to lose that frequency. Absolutely. There is no free lunch. It always, it, no pain, no gain. If you remove something using the software, you're going to lose something. So I, I can identify. Some people cannot identify, but I, I, I do. And you know what, too? A lot of the, the Giorgio Morota, like the Donna Summer stuff, a lot of the Donna Summer stuff that I have, when you listen to the tapes raw, like, I don't know how they did what they did when they released it, because it, some of it raw, <laughs> it sounds like it's horrendous. But no, but I agree. The, the first pressing I heard in Brazil, the album Could Be Magic, that first that, that album, including the Could Be Magic, the press in Brazil, it's terrible. It's yeah. horrible. The yeah. press, it's, oh, man. It's a uh... okay. Let's see if we have some to finalize some more. Uh, it's a good talking. Let me check if we have more. Uh, okay, a lot of stuff here. Uh, well, I think it's good. Uh, I think uh, I'm very happy we, we were able to cover the the most important topics because it's impossible to cover <laughs> all kind of stuff using the two hours. We're almost there. I would like to. To thank, thank you for the uh, that big session. Share your ideas, your experience. Right now, a lot of people you, you got a popularity in the audience in every in different place of this planet in Brazil, Americas, Europe. For myself, it's uh, as I always said. Uh, even playing music, I'm not music is not my business. Uh, for you know, and um, for your knowledge, and but. I learn it every day with the friends from you and a lot of guys. I love this. I have a, I have a passionate. I, I did everything I did, listen to music, produce some, uh, play my podcasts or something like that. It's, it's, uh, I love that. I research. I, I love to get information about the history and the guys, the techniques. It's for passion. It's not, it's not about the business, uh, for your knowledge. Okay. So in the end, I would like to, to leave you free to to leave the comments for the audience for myself i'm very proud to have opportunity thanks again i just want to say one thing my I just, invitation i just want to say one thing i have a friend of mine that's watching that's in the hospital right now and i just want to say hello oh, really? to this Where? person in the hospital in the new york yeah and i just want to say hello and i hope you feel better because i know they're watching okay stay away if, uh, uh sending positive vibes right and yeah, I need all my friend, all all my music friends to send some positive vibes for me. Okay, again, uh, in the end of the session, uh, I'd like to to send the big shouts again for the Jane Negron, Donna Cleveland, a lot of inspiration, and uh, uh, Johnny D, the Vincent, uh, DJ Spina, uh, Paul Simpson. I have uh, exchanged a lot of emails ab about uh, his projects. I uh, love those guys. I learn it every day. Uh, so that's it. Feel free to, to leave the message for the audience of all the guys. Again, thank you very much. Love thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks.